Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and the letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews. Oh, we're in the book of Hebrews, going right back to your Sunday school days by singing the song of the books of the New Testament. James, first and second Peter, first and second and third John, Jude and Revelation. I remember when I was growing up, I was a senior in high school. My mother and father and I went to a church Halloween uh, party at, with at, took boxes and, and made them into outhouses. We went as first, second, and third John. <laughs> All right. Those great theologians, Pink Floyd, and that fabulous album, The Wall, start off a song called Comfortably Numb with, Is Anybody Out There? And we're going to start off the book of, uh, of Hebrews with, Is Anybody Listening? Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. I'm reading out in the New King James Version. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Let me tell you a true story. True story. I, I didn't know this guy. I just read this guy, and it's verified. It's a true story. Uh, he, he visited the doctor. He visited his doctor to have his hearing checked, and uh, and during the visit, uh, the doctor looked in his ear and pulled his hearing aid out, and immediately the guy's hearing got better. And the guy said, "I don't understand why my hearing got better." And the doctor said, "Well." You've been wearing your hearing aid in the wrong ear for 20 years. I ran into a preacher several years back. He was a little bit frustrated uh, because the congregation there wasn't doing much of anything. And, and, uh, and at that time, the congregation I was in uh, were just starting a, a, a deaf ministry. And, uh, and a ministry to using sign language. And, and, uh, and I said to him, well, have you ever started considering a deaf ministry? And he says, you know, I think the whole church needs a deaf ministry. There are times when I'm sure they don't hear what I'm saying. Okay, this is a class for adults. <clears throat> and so we are adults in here. So we have figured out by now the difference between listening and hearing. You see, sometimes we can hear what somebody says, but we're just not listening to him, uh, to them. One of Jesus' favorite sayings in the Bible was, he who has ears, let them hear. You know, use your ears, you, you, use, your, use your mind, use your brain. He who has a brain, let him think. You know, what it means is it takes more than, than this, okay? It takes more than this to hear what God wants to say to us. You see, it takes a heart that's ready to listen. Hebrews chapter three, verses seven through eight. So as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Hebrews is a book, honestly, that has been kind of overlooked because it was written to Jewish Christians. And you know, not many of us are Jewish Christians. I know one. So we don't really understand what it's trying to say to us. But to avoid the book of Hebrews is to avoid so much practical help in our lives. So tonight, to kick things off, we're going to lay some foundation. Now, I want you to understand that the first lesson of one of these is always very statistical and, uh, and rather wordy and somewhat dull, okay? But if you're a Bible scholar nerd like me, uh, you just love this stuff. But we're going to look at five specific characteristics at the book of, at the letter to the Hebrews. Now, number one is that it's a book of Eva. Now, since I'm a preacher, all of these are going to start in E, okay? So number one, it's a book of evaluations. Now, I want you to, to, to uh, write down for me, by the way, go to the, pause this and, and go to the website and download the outline. 
and, uh, and follow along with us. You'll be glad you did. Uh, and, and so we're going to look at three words that you're going to see over and over in this book. You know, you're going to see them a lot of times that they're written, and we'll see how they can apply to our lives. Now, the first one is the word better. Better. Used 13 times in the book of Hebrews. The word better is used to show the superiority of Jesus Christ and his salvation over what we find in the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament was, was made up basically of the Ten Commandments. And then the Jewish scholars came along and wrote 13 extra books of laws as commentary on those Ten Commandments. And, and the writer tells us that Jesus Christ is better than the angels and that he brought us a better hope and that he mediated, he negotiated for us a better covenant which was established on better promises, the word better. Pay attention to how often you hear that. The second is the word perfect, all right? In the original Greek, that word perfect, that's used 14 times. And it means having a perfect standing before God. It doesn't mean being perfect. It means having a perfect stand before God. Now, this perfection could not be achieved by Old Testament priests or by Old Testament laws. This perfection could not be achieved in the sacrificing of animals. You see, Jesus gave himself as an offering for sin once and for all, and by that offering, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. You say, that's a wordy statement. Yes, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. So whoever wrote this book, and we really don't have an author's name. Uh, most scholars say Paul. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with whoever wrote it, okay? Uh, because it's, it's so fabulous. And, uh, and, and so whoever wrote this book is contrasting the Old Testament, which had its laws, with the New, the New Testament, which was based on the grace of God. And his point was that, Old Testament faith was always just temporary and it couldn't bring you eternal things and better things that are found in Christ Jesus. So, and then the third word, so that is the, so, so that is the, uh, the, the word, uh, the word perfect. The third word is the word eternal. Okay. Eternal. And it's an important word. In fact, I'm going to say it is the most important word in this letter. Let me just explain. Let me read these to you. Christ is the author of eternal salvation. There's that word eternal. I want you to, I want you to count how many times you hear eternal in these next set of verses. Hebrews 5, 9. Christ is the author of eternal salvation. Hebrews 9, 12. Through his death, he obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews 9, 15. He shares with us the promise of eternal inheritance. Hebrews 5, 7. His throne is eternal and he is a priest forever. Hebrews 13, 8. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, when we combine those words that you just wrote down, what we discover is that Jesus Christ and the life you and I can have in Jesus Christ is better because the blessings are eternal and they give us a perfect standing before God. Let's talk about the religious system that existed before the new covenant. It was good, okay? It taught them the difference between right and wrong. It told them what to do and what not to do. Let me tell you what was missing from that. Redemption. Your sins were never washed away. They were covered but once a year, you had to go back, or once a week, or however often that you sinned, you had to go back and offer that animal sacrifice so that what you did could be covered, but there was no future, there was no present and future condition to it. And so what the old law couldn't provide was redemption, where it means to buy back, that was eternal. Now, why did whoever wrote this book ask his readers to evaluate their faith and what Jesus Christ had to offer them. I'm glad you asked that question. Here's how come. Because they were going through some hard times. I mean, times were difficult. And so often, when times get tough, we tend to look back on the good old days. 
we tend to remember all the marvelous things we had, the good old days of the 70s. Oh, the music was amazing, and everything was good, and it was before. You know, I grew up in the 70s. We had things like Watergate and, and, uh, and inflation that was out of control. And, and, uh, and so, I mean, we, we, you know, the old, the old days weren't that great, but just like us, they were going through some hard times, and so that they were being tempted to go back into their Jewish roots. See, because the priests were still carrying on their daily ceremonies. They were still doing their thing. And by going back in their roots, they could avoid persecution, which gives you an idea who was persecuting them, a little history. These brothers and sisters in Christ that this letter addresses were second-generation Christians. Their mothers and fathers had been taught by Jesus or people that knew Jesus personally. So they were real believers. I mean, they seen, witnessed, and, and yes, we're going to do this. Now, real believers. You know, I love going to little hospitals in places like Rosenberg and and, and these little county seat towns, and, and, uh, and, and, and here's how come I love that. <clears throat> because in those, not in the big city Houston hospitals, they couldn't care less, but in those little regional out-of-town, out-of-place out of hospitals, um, they still ask you what church you go to. And they do that so when you're in the hospital, they can call somebody from the congregation so that they know you're in the hospital and come out and visit you. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's a very nice thing. If somebody goes into Oak Bend and, and, and Richmond, uh, then Richmond Rosenberg, then they can, uh, then, then it went, the minute, immediately when they go in, you'll get a call from the hospital going, hey, this person is in and they say they're a member of Westbury Church of Christ. Now, I'll tell you what happens more often than you would, than you would bet, than re, more, more often than you would think. It's that I get a call from one of these little outlying hospitals and say one of the members of your congregation is in here and they'll give me the name and I haven't got a clue who they are. And I've been here 15 years, so I pretty much know everybody. So I'll ask Ann, who's been here longer than I have, and Ann will say, nope, don't know him. And then I'll ask Joyce, who's been here a good long time, and she says, no, I don't know him. And if Ann and Joyce don't know him, I'll call Dolores, because she's been here a long time. And if Dolores says, nope, I don't know him, then I'll head out there knowing that it is the first time them and I will meet. And it's amazing. Now, let's see. Uh, the preacher before me was Bill Yasko. The preacher before him was Eddie Stevens. And it's amazing how many times I'll walk into a room and somebody will say to me, where's Brother Stevens? Uh, he left about 30 years ago. Uh, and so it gives you an idea how, how long they've been, how, how long it's been since they've been to church. Uh, and, so, and so these guys had been persecuted in their faith and yet they had not stopped ministering to others. During the persecutions, they were being sweet-talked by the Jewish teachers and promising them that, you know what, I will see to it personally that those that are persecuting you will, will quit if you just come back to the true faith. And they were in danger of allowing their situation to determine their ethics. That was a big phrase when I was growing up, situation ethics where I allow my situation to determine how I'm going to act and how I'm going to behave. You used to give this illustration that, you know, if you were, if you were a female and you were in jail and, and, and it was an un, uh, and you were innocent and it was a railroad job and, and the only way you could get out of jail was to have a baby. And so uh, you would lure a guard into your room and, and, and become with child and they would, remove you from the prison because you were having a baby and the situation determined the ethics. If that was the way to get out of there, then you should get out of there. Now, these guys were falling for the same trap. They were in, in, they were in danger of allowing what was going on to determine their, their concept of right and wrong. And it was starting to work. And their faith was at a standstill. In fact, they were going backwards. You see, here is the dilemma. And it's their dilemma back then, and it's our dilemma now. When it comes to our faith, if we're not going forward, we're going backward. 
okay? In Christianity, there's no such thing as having a static faith. There's no such thing as going, oh, how's your faith? So, so, no, no. It's either growing or it's dying. It's either dynamic or it's static. It's going to grow or it's going to die. Uh, and, and, so, uh, and so I take that back. It's not static, it's dynamic in that. So, all right, that was number one. Number two, it's a book of exhortation. I exhort you, Hebrews 13, 22, brothers, I heard you to bear with my word of exhortation, for I've written you only a short letter. Now, to exhort somebody means to encourage them. By the way, to console somebody comes from the same root word, okay? And, and, and the root word that, and the word that ties those two root words together is the word we get comfort from. Now, in the course of the book of Hebrews, you will come across five specific warnings. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 says, do not drift from the word. That has to do with neglect. Hebrews chapter 3, uh, 7 through 4, 13 says, don't doubt the word. That's got to do with allowing our hearts, hearts to get hard. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 20 says, don't let the word get dull. Now, this has to do with being sluggish in our faith. And then Hebrews chapter 10, 26 through 39, uh, it, it says, uh, it, it tells us not to despise the world. That means don't have anything to do with willful sin. That means don't go looking for sin. And then number five, and finally, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 29 says, don't defy the word. This has to do with refusing to hear. Now, here's what that all means. Let me sum all that up for you. If we don't listen to God's word, I mean hear it. I mean, taste it. Get sensual with God's word. Okay? That means involve all the senses in God's word. Hear it. Taste it. Feel it. See it. Do it. The, the, you know, because neglect always leads to drifting. Now, as we drift from God's word, we start doubting God's word, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. And after we've doubted for a while, we start getting hard hearts. And once our hearts have been hardened for a while, we become spiritually sluggish, which in turn produces dullness toward God's word. In other words, we become lazy listeners. And the Bible calls being a lazy listener dull of hearing. So we become lazy listeners, which leads to a spiteful attitude toward the word of God to where we willfully disobey God, which eventually moves over to a defiant attitude where we dare, to God do, dare God to do something about it. So God, what does God do when, when we go through our times where we are spiritually moving backwards? Well, God continues to encourage us to get back into the word. Because if we don't listen, he starts disciplining us. And, and when he disciplines us, you read that in, in Hebrews 12, it says the Lord will judge his people. That God isn't going to allow his children to become spoiled brats by letting us willfully deny his word. Let me just tell you another thing. God always disciplines in love. Okay? So God exhorts us. And then number three is that it is a book of examination. All right, as we go through this book, we'll start questioning ourselves. We'll ask, okay, who am I really trusting? I mean, where is my faith? Am I trusting the word of God or am I trusting the things of the world that are shaken and, and ready to fall away? All right, now this letter all the scholars agree that this letter was written to a bunch of folks who were at a strategic time in their history because the temple was still standing. The center of the Jewish world was still standing. Sacrifices were still being offered. Now, history tells us that in just a few years, that Jewish temple would be, would be destroyed and, and, uh, and, and the nation would scatter through what was called a diaspora or diaspora including those members of the church with Jewish roots. See, God was shaking things up. God wanted, God, God, God wanted his people to have their feet 
on the solid foundation of his word instead of having one foot on his word and one foot in the world. I believe today we're living under very similar circumstances because everything is changing at warp speed. Everything. We've had to learn new everythings this last year. And, and, and when we discover that it's moving at warp speed, and if we don't have our feet solidly in the world, uh, that, 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 that we discover that we're depending on the scaffolding instead of the foundation. We're depending on all the stuff that go, that, that, that stacked around it rather than what it is itself. And as a result, and I'm sorry to say this, there are a whole lot of churches left that are not driven by God. Okay, they're, they're, they're driven by money, they're driven by buildings, they're driven by programs, they're driven by traditions, but you know, all that stuff's going to pass away. And as God continues to shake up our society, the scaffolding on the foundation will fall away, which is why we must be driven with a purpose for God. Because God wants our hearts to be established in grace. Now, there's another word that's used an awful lot in this, in, in this book, established. It's used nine times in here. It means to be solidly grounded, to stand firm on your feet, and it's one of strength, reliability, confirmation, and permanence. Now, if you don't get anything else out of this lesson tonight, please get this. We can be secure when everything around us is falling apart, but that only applies to those who have been baptized into the blood of Jesus Christ. That only applies to those who are believers who have heard the word and embraced the word and are willing to do the words. Christ saves us eternally when we belong to him. If we don't belong to him, all the bets are off. I read a story about a, uh, an inspector that got on a bus and uh, he was the ticket taker. He wanted to make sure everybody had the right ticket to the right place. First ticket he looked at, he said, you know what? You're on the wrong bus. Second ticket he looked at, he said, you know what? You're on the wrong bus. Third ticket he looked at, he said, you're on the wrong bus. And this time the passenger said, wait a minute, I'm on the bus they told me to get on. They told me to get on this bus. Inspector says, I'll be right back, went and talked to the driver. And then he went back and announced to everybody, I apologize, it seems like I'm on the wrong bus. And he went and got on his bus again. Uh, it, you know, we, that, that, the, the, that we can get so busy telling everybody else what to do, that we, we don't see where we are. We fail to see our own situation. That's called behavioral teaching. And, and I want you to know, I expect it out of our teachers here at Westbury. So going through this book will help us examine where our faith really is. Number four, it's a book of expectation. It is focused on the future, verse, chapter 2, verse 5. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. Now, we are just strangers on this earth. Okay, you've heard me say this for 15 years. This life we're living is not the main event. It's the warm-up act. We get 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years to get right so that we can live for eternity in the right place. And God wants to center us, our lives, on our lives, on, on, uh, on, on the world that's after this world. Now, here's what this doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we, can be, that we are to be so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. I've known people like that, that constantly thought of things of heaven, and as a result, you couldn't rely on them. And so it's not what he says. You know, he, he does say this. He does say that we, as far as this world is concerned, and this is really important right now, we're just going to hang loose. Because this is just nursery school. The heater, Hebrew writer expects us to have already come to terms with that thought. Which leads me into a thought, you know, when you're in high school, uh, that all the class the freshmen take, or in college, all the class the freshmen take start with one, you know, economics 101. Uh, and second year classes, they, uh, sophomore classes, it starts with two, economics 201. All the way up to where you're senior in college, and that's 401. Graduate school 
then you're in the classes that start 501 and 601. That means you're five and six years into your studies. And Hebrews is not a Bible 101 book. Hebrews is a Bible 501 book. It's maybe even a 601 level book because it is full of spiritual meat and we've got to put on our spiritual teeth and do some serious chewing. You see, Jesus is the great high priest who enables us by giving us his grace. But he's also the great shepherd who enables us, who, excuse me, who equips us to do his will. And he's working in us to accomplish his purposes. Now, as human beings, we must choose our world. You see, we, we, we get to choose which world we're part of. We can be friends with God and get it all. Or we can be friends with the world and lose it all. And then finally, it is a book of exaltation. It exalts the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I told you they all started in E. And the first three verses set the mood and the tone that is maintained for the rest of the book. Here's what the writer wants to prove. That Jesus Christ is superior to all, but especially the Old Testament prophets. You say, well, why, why is that important today? I'll tell you why it's important today, because there are plenty of people that have their idea of what God's word says, and they, they marginalize and sometimes eliminate Jesus Christ. Okay. And, and they, they marginalize or sometimes dismiss Jesus Christ. And, and so he says... In his person, Jesus is superior to the Old Testament prophets. He's the son of God. Hebrews 1, 3. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now, let's take a look at a couple things in that verse. First, I want you to look at the phrase, the radiance of God's glory. All right, let me, let me translate that for you literally word for word from the Greek. It says, Jesus is to the Father what the rays of sun are to the sun. That's the radiance of God's glory. It is impossible to separate uh, the rays from the sun itself. It's also impossible to separate Christ's glory from the nature of God. Now, look at the phrase, the exact representation. All right, that is the exact same phrase that's used to describe a, a metal stamp. You know, something that you stamp, that, uh, like a seal, uh, something that you stamp out a, a, a trademark on it. It's the exact representation of what, uh, what's on that stamp. And in his work, Jesus is superior to the prophets. To start with, he created the universe, Hebrews 1, 2. He appointed his son, heir of all things, and through him he made the universe. And in his work, Jesus is sustaining all things. Sustaining means to uphold, to carry from one place to another, like if you're in a courtroom and an and, and a, 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 a attorney stands up and says, objection, and the judge says, sustain. That means I'm carrying that objection. If the judge says overruled, that means I'm not paying attention to that. Jesus is a prophet, but he's superior to the other prophets. You see, in the Old Testament, those prophets were called uh, were, were men called by God, and they were called men of God. But Jesus is the Son of God. You know, there's only one Son of God. There's a lot of prophets. The Old Testament prophets, their view of the future was fragmented and incomplete, whereas Jesus' message was final and complete. Jesus is a priest. He purged our sins from us. Jesus is reigning as king. He sat down on the right hand of God. That is the place of honor. No created being could ever sit at the right hand of God. So creator, prophet, priest, king, Jesus is over everything. At the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was glorified. And, uh, and actually, if you remember that story, there were two Old Testament prophets there, Moses and Elijah, the two most trusted prophets in, Jew, in the Jewish faith, Moses and Elijah. And here's what they told everybody that was there. Listen to him. 
you got to listen to him. Peter wanted to build a, a monument to this moment. And Moses and Elijah said, no, dummy, listen to him. Don't build something. He's greater than us. We all have this tendency to get bogged down in details. We're going to not let that happen in this, in this class. What Hebrews has to say to us is way too important. So our purpose is to hear God speak in Christ Jesus and then do what he tells us to do. Let us pray. Our God, be with us as we study this book. Father, make it fresh, make it new. Teach us something that we didn't know so that we can add that to the things and the treasure that is your word within us. God bless this congregation. Father, we ask your blessings on our elders, our deacons, our ministers, our teachers. Our, uh, our Father, we ask that you bless the entire congregation. Be with Westbury Christian School. Be with Nathan Wagner as, uh, as Father, he leads the school through um, uncharted waters. Father, uh, I ask that you continue to be with us and bless us in Jesus' name.